We believe that, you know, that a carbon dioxide actually uh, affects the fascia. Mm -hmm. And since we've spent the past nine or 10 months now working with the, the leaders in fascia uh, applications, the, the human garage, uh, mm -hmm. We're now seeing that that uh, being able to affect fascia affects so many different organs in the body, so many different areas of the human, you know, physiology and psychophysiology. Yeah. All right. So on today's call, I have Kareem Delgado. He's the founder of Brain Mechanics. Io. And before we get started with the call, we're just going to breathe for a few moments using the relaxator. Beautiful. Thank you, Steve. All right. So, uh -huh. yeah. So, I, as I mentioned, you're the founder of Brain Mechanics. Io. Io. And so, why don't you just tell us a little bit about Brain Mechanics, what you guys do, and kind of how you got started, and a little bit about your background. Well, first, Steve, I'm really relaxed right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> we just did the relaxator, and uh, I, I was prior to this, I was running around, I was trying to get on a, an invest, investor uh, deck, kind of finished, mm -hmm. polished off really quick, and running all over the place. Mm -hmm. And now um, yeah, we just sat and we just did the relaxator. I got myself a little bit of state of uh, equanimity as I did it, and uh, wow, feel really relaxed. Yeah, Thank yeah, that's you. awesome. I, I feel relaxed too. I was kind of running around myself right before the call as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so brain mechanics. So, so first of all, thank you for having me uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a huge admirer of your work. Uh, I think that the work that you guys are doing in conscious breathing is is, is fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it really revolutionary with uh, carbon carbon dioxide and carbon mm -hmm. and all kinds of different things that way. I think it really has a, a you know the the potential to impact uh, millions of people in a really really positive way. Yeah, thank you. So first, I want to thank you for that, and I was really really attracted to uh, talking to you today because of that, right? You guys are doing some just really fantastic work and mm -hmm. I see how um, literally some of the devices and things that you're, you've got going on are, are uh, you know, kind of like the, the microscopes of the telescopes of the near world, right? Yeah. Providing insights and, and uh, at Brain Mechanics, we do quite a bit of big data of the body type research. And uh, so we're really excited about, you know, all the different things that you guys are working on because mm -hmm. uh, I think it'd be uh, just fantastic to be able to, Measure the effects, uh, at the profound effects across different types of, you know, dimensions of the human body. But yeah, yeah, thanks. We're uh, excited to uh, collaborate with yeah. you guys as well, and all that you're doing. So yeah, so uh, yeah, so brain mechanics is something uh, that that uh, we've been around for about eight years now. Uh, and uh, my background is uh, so I'm not a doctor or, or I don't play one on the internet either. <laughs> 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 but uh. <clears throat> But what I am is uh, I've been in research and development for about 20 years in many different verticals from, you know, uh, you know, uh, telecommunications to the, the health space uh, uh, to even more advanced like AI and things like that on the mm -hmm. wellness side of things. And uh, 
and worked in the energy field and things like that as well. And uh, so, so you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, um, I also come from a, a medical family. So my dad was a doctor, my brother's a doctor, and my sister's a nurse. Uh, and uh, so they, um, they, you know, they've been around medicine for a while. And um, I guess about um, nine years ago, uh, my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, mm. and which is a form of dementia. And uh, it was pretty, pretty profound uh, event in our lives because uh, he was actually a doctor, a gastroenterologist, and uh, semi-retired. He worked at a nursing home, and um, as a you know, kind of managing it. And he saw that fifty percent of the people there had Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah, uh, which is pretty bad. So when the diagnostics came into you know uh, came into the picture, it was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty profound. He knew what he was kind of getting into. It's going to be uh, kind of crazy, right? But mm-hmm. Having, having gone through that experience, just seeing him, you know, going through his life and, and kind of losing his memories and his emotions yeah, and, and stuff. Uh, luckily, it didn't, it didn't, didn't take his heart, but, uh, yeah. but uh, just having him seeing that, going through that, um, I, I promised him that I was going to try to find a solution for it. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, I uh, you know, I had to kind of open my heart kind of take on the, the mission and and um and since then it's been wonderful uh you know i've been putting together uh over eight years now a team uh world experts and you know applied uh uh you know neurology and mm-hmm. applied uh, you know things like uh, systems biology and you know a whole bunch of different disciplines you know here out out west we only have you know biochemical biochemical medicine uh, and, and surgery, but other places of the world, they have all kinds of different medicines and different modalities. So we started kind of building together on the therapeutic side, a stack of almost like MMA. We have these multiple disciplines, mm-hmm. uh, to try to see how we could actually move the needle with these, uh, not only Alzheimer's, but orphan neurological disorders. And soon realized that, um, for us to actually take on these complex problems, uh, not only did we need like multiple disciplines, but also, a health technology stack that would allow us to actually measure and quantify the human body at 10x. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, things like, you know, replacing an MRI that's $3,500 into a virtual MRI, which, you know, honestly costs us a little bit less than a dollar to capture mm-hmm. brain functional uh, using these devices, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as well as measuring things like sleep, you know, sleep platforms like Alzheimer's that have huge problems going to sleep and, and staying asleep. Uh, they don't make enough delta waves. Uh, and mm. delta waves is when your 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 brain actually shrinks and your lymphatic system takes away mm. all these amyloid mm-hmm. plaques and all these things that the toxins that built up in there, right? So we had to build our own like uh, health technology platform for sleep, uh, yeah. and then even affecting sleep. How do you actually induce these things? Mm-hmm. Uh, so we spent quite a bit of time and energy doing that, and it's been fast forward now uh, eight years of pretty intense R and D, and and we've come up with different uh, reference protocols that we're making open source for Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury tinnitus and other serious conditions uh and and we're just sharing those openly with the world uh this is what we found mm-hmm. um and then on the technology side we're looking to actually help out uh companies and build an ecosystem of other like-minded who are actually looking to apply a, a think different approach to uh to wellness and and health uh specifically you know doing what we we're thinking of which is smart wellness right so evidence-based wellness because I'm not a doctor, but, you know, we can capture some information and doctors and others can try things and capture, you know, information after yeah. we can know whether we're heading in the right direction or not. So, so that's what we, we've been all about. And we are looking to democratize these different technologies and these different protocols, mm-hmm. uh, share them openly and freely with the world uh, in order to help people, you know, improve the quality of living, the quality of life. Yeah, you know the quality of uh, the, you know the level of happiness that they have in their lives, and mm-hmm. you know, like to think of what we're building, uh, what's called a humanistic computing systems and humanistic systems in general, uh, mm-hmm. and and you know, we we believe that technology should be there to actually help us make us better human beings, and and you know, spiritual beings as well, and and emotional beings, and and all kinds of right, and so that's what we've been uh, working on uh, for a while, and uh, we're pretty excited about. Uh, collaborating with you guys because uh, I, I really see that the work that you're doing are really are honestly the leaders in breath and breath analysis, uh, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, and I think uh, the potential to taking a, a breath analysis tools and then and then cross correlating with other big data of the body, you know, data sets could really help us to understand the human body at a deep level because. 
deeper than anything I think we've ever done before. Because, uh, I mean, the more I'm learning about breath, the more I realize I don't know anything about breath. It spans from the scientific measurements of 30 or 40 different variables to, you know, even like on the religious scripts where it's like the breath of God, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're getting on this <laughs> this this path of, of breath, you know, it's uh, it's the whole gambit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And I think that understanding the breath and all those different dimensions, I think, would, would benefit uh, mankind, mm -hmm. as well as even affecting affecting health uh, with, with the work that you're doing with CO2 and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some really interesting hypotheses that we, we believe that, you know, now that, that we have some of the equipment uh, to start testing them out, that could really significant the quality of life of people. Yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah, we believe that, you know, that a carbon dioxide actually uh, affects the fascia. Mm -hmm. And since we've spent the past nine or 10 months now working with the, the leaders in fascia uh, applications, the, the human garage, uh, mm -hmm. We're now seeing that that uh, being able to affect fascia affects so many different organs in the body, so many different areas of the human, you know, physiology and psychophysiology. Yeah, you know, um, and so so it's really exciting there uh, to see how it could actually be from the biology side to actually helping people de-stress at a global scale like never they've experienced before. Mm -hmm. To to on the biological side, are the impact, impacts of that of even I, we believe it's going to impact you know, potentially uh, epigenetic aging, mm -hmm. you know, and we've seen it. We've seen it with other interventions of fascia, but we believe that, that combining the, the CO2 applications are going to be uh, game-changing. Yeah, so what, what is, um, before we get into to fascia and everything, so what is, like, how does one get diagnosed with Alzheimer's? What are the, what are, what are the things they measure? Yeah, so, you know, with Alzheimer's, there are different ways of, of Alzheimer's is a label, really. I mm -hmm. mean, it's a collection of symptoms, yeah. but they're just labeling it as, uh, Alzheimer's and 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 uh, and so you know you have loss of memory and you can have like you know a subjective and and cognitive uh, de decreasing of performance so things like you you know you, um, you can remember things or you're trying to th a word trying to think about a word and it doesn't come to mind uh, right away uh, you know losing stopping not remembering people's names and things like that right mm -hmm. and eventually it escalates so it could be from mild to to more you know subjective to mild to to then more severe loss of functions, you know, um, and it's right now they're looking for pretty, like trying to get a diagnostic tool that actually serves the diagnostics, uh, like things like a blood test and things like that. They're, they're making progress in those areas. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, at Brain Mechanics, for example, we measure brain functions. Mm -hmm. So we can measure brain functions and then you should be able to extrapolate like, okay, this person's functional level, you know, like we could, we can correlate brain functions to traumatic brain injuries. Uh, to Alzheimer's and things like that, right? Yeah. Uh, that's one area, but then you also have different areas of assessing the autonomic nervous system, the impact to Alzheimer's autonomic nervous system. So that's some of the areas that we look at. Mm. You can also look at uh, areas of vestibular nerve functions and also ocular health. So we can look at ocular health and say, like, you could actually see, like, amyloid plaque buildup and things like that on the eyes, you know? Mm. Uh, and also the eyes also correlate directly to different parts of the brain, mm. brain functions. Uh, so there's all kinds of different assessments you could do, but then Really, at the end of the day, uh, following the medical model, <clears throat> I think the closest that comes into having a solution is uh, the Recode Protocol by Dr. Bredenson. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a molecular uh, neurologist. And, uh, and what, what happened, neuroscience, actually, neuroscience. And what, what he found is that, uh, you know, unlike what everybody else is, is pursuing, which is amyloid plaque theory, mm -hmm. uh, that amyloid plaque builds in your brain and then therefore it causes all these different, uh, you know, wrecks in your biology, yeah. uh, what he was saying is that the amyloid plaque is actually a result, an amyloid plaque buildup is actually a result of natural, uh, like a natural process, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when he saw that, he realized that he started to kind of dive into understanding the cause of Alzheimer's. So there's different mm -hmm. types of Alzheimer's. Some Alzheimer's that, you know, the amyloid plaque, for example, uh, it, part of causing Alzheimer's is toxic level buildup in the brain and, and toxicity. From and like toxin. One of the major, there's okay. Like to it could be, uh, you know, it could be industrial toxins, it could be farming toxins, it could mm. be neurotoxins. It could even be something that's very common um, that uh, literally like we could see, you know, um, in, in New Orleans, for example, after floods or, or Houston, uh, Puerto Rico, or even mm. here in Calgary, I guarantee you that you're going to see a high incident of Alzheimer's uh, in the next few years because when you have a flood, you have toxic mold. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
And toxic mold is actually one of the other, uh, it's a, a type of, you know, toxicity, mold toxicity that actually induces Alzheimer's type uh, symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, there's toxic, there's, there's things like you're, you know, as you age, you don't make enough hormones, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because of X, Y, and, and, and Z reasons of the environment and things. And um, when you don't make enough hormones, your body then produces amyloid plaque to also get, make sure that you don't keep growing neurons. Okay. So it's like a protective so mechanism it, kind of? Or? It's a protective mechanism. Yeah. And then, and then the same thing with uh, having a high insulin, like a high sugar, you know, like it, it actually takes care of this glycotoxic Alzheimer's. Is taking away the, the toxic levels from having the standard American diet, mm -hmm. right? And then there's others, which is what most people consider the boogeyman, where it's like, do you have the Alzheimer's gene? And and so all that means is that you have a gene that when we were hunter and gatherers, whenever we cut ourselves, we would get inflamed really fast. Mm -hmm. and, and because we got inflamed really fast, um, we would not die from all these bacteria that got in, in our body, right? Or viruses and things, right? Mm -hmm. And and so well, fast forward now a few million years into the future, and now we're not getting cut in the jungle, but we're actually having a standard American diet. We're eating, you know, uh, fats that are rancid and, and processed foods. You know, we're having tons of sugar spiced everywhere. You know, we're having uh, incremental stress levels that are increasing our inflammation, uh, and and then all these things are actually now you're you're kind of putting, uh, you know, fuel into a, uh, you know into the fire mm -hmm. and, and, and then you have now, you know, people who are affected, who have that gene, who have that inflammation. Yeah. So that's so the primary approach right now with all the drugs and everything. Is it to r reduce the amyloid plaque or break it down or is that the, well, uh, approach no, uh, we, uh, so with, with, with the Bredenson protocol, what we do is, which I'm actually, I'm I mean, not, not your protocol, that's the standard yeah, medical. Yeah. Protocol. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. the, with the Bredenson protocol, uh, what, what we're doing there is we're actually looking to identify the root cause of the Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. first. Yeah. And then once you have the root cause of the Alzheimer's, there's probably like 30 or 40 different types of interventions that you could do to actually remediate it. The problem is that um, the Bredenson protocol helps with remediation of that issue so that the, the, the downstream, like once you actually go to the root level, the amyloid plaque will stop being produced. Mm-hmm. Having said that, where the Branson protocol uh, stops and brain mechanics continue is that now we need to kind of fix that whole wreckage that took place after everything was wrecked. Yeah. So you could stop the bleeding, but you still have to go in and actually go in and, and help out with, you know, an analogous to being in an emergency room. You go in and actually, you know, uh, remediate a lot of stuff that's actually happening. So you mm -hmm. got the patient stable, but now, and that's where the rest of the protocol comes in. So, you know, we, we, what we build is we treated the human body as a, like a factory process kind of thing. There are different areas or dimensions that have to be optimized, right? Mm -hmm. So once you have somebody who is uh, stable and, the, and just on the Bredenson protocol alone, people are, which is a, a functional medicine intervention, meaning lifestyle changes, nutrition, little exercise, things that people have been preaching for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Along with some tuning of other things that could help like, you know, if it's toxic mold, then you're going to use ozone therapy to help remediate that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like that, right? Uh, but then once you get over that, uh, the, re the, the rebuilding process is where we come in. So, you know, we, we start with, you know, we, we started looking at the problem saying, okay, well, these people at the cellular level, they're damaged. Their mm -hmm. proteins are not folding mm -hmm. properly. And if they're not folding properly, the, ex the, the programs that the proteins have to execute, they're like little computer systems, they won't work. Well, just imagine 40 and over, you have about 30% proteins that are not folded properly. They misfold. Yeah. And if they misfold, they can't function properly, right? The computers can't make hormones and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So after you're 40, usually about 30% of your, you have 30% uh, misfolded proteins, and somebody who's got Alzheimer's and dementia, fast forward that, every year, I mean, every, every you know, say 40, 50, or 60, or 70 years, not, not only do you have the age-related uh, brain function, uh, you know, cellular functions not properly because of the cellular structures, but you also have this damage that you did with your reactive oxygen stress, like mm. uh, species, mm -hmm. right? So, so they're really wrecked. So if you're going to help somebody who's got Alzheimer's, you got to go to the cellular level, and you have to fix the protein. So we do that. We show people how to actually, on this protocol, fix the proteins. How do you fix the proteins? Once the proteins are, what's that? How do you fix the proteins? Oh, that's very simple. There's a device called NanoV. NanoV mm -hmm. and NanoV, they're, they're one of our, uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, research study 
uh, sponsors. They've, they've graciously lent us a machine so we can measure the effects of their device. And we measure the effects of, of Nano B at the cellular level. Mm. And, and then we saw that they actually fixed the protein fold, folding problem. But you have to go to facilities and it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's really great, great, great device. Mm. But um, anyway, so, so then, yeah. And then you have to optimize people at the mitochondrial level because they have to have enough energy. Yeah. So our process goes into the cellular level. Then we're getting into like actually helping rewire. Like once you have the cell stable, then you actually have to work on being able to get them to uh, rewire, reconfigure themselves, right? So we get into like, for example, a person who's got Alzheimer's and dementia, well, they need to have uh, the growth factors that they need for the brain, right? So it's almost like if you're going to be bodybuilding, you need certain hormones, yeah. right, to grow muscles and stuff like that, right? Where Alzheimer's patients, they need hormones for their brain, right? So part of the stack that we have of the, uh, the Alzheimer's resolution protocol is to actually be able to induce something called vascular endothelial growth factors, which is the miracle grow of uh, the cardiovascular system. But then we also mix that up with miracle grow of the brain, kind of. It's called uh, BDNF, brain-derived neutral mm -hmm. growth factors. And, and we then uh, were able to induce that in the brain. And now the patient is able, uh, the client is able to have the growth factors they need to generate new neurons. And then the vascular system being able to stimulate so it has enough blood and oxygen going in there. Um, and then we do things like, you know, we, we simulate high altitude. So we are able to take a person to feel like it's 50,000 feet above sea, sea yeah. level. And what that does, it, it increases the plasma count by 500%. And the plasma is what actually transports oxygen into uh, the parts of the body. And then we then trick the body into incre increasing the amount of oxygen that it can transport by five times. So it'll absorb five times the amount of oxygen mm -hmm. and it'll transport five to 500. And then all that is going into the brain. And what that does, Steve, it, it literally lights people up. You got a traumatic brain injury, you got a Alzheimer's, you got a whatever is going to be like light you up. Yeah. And once we light them up, then we then use things like neurofeedback, which is like a very precise re-sculpting of a person's neurological wiring so that we can then rebuild areas that have been atrophied. So think about it as being like a specific, like, you know, say, for example, you're working out in the gym and you got like weak biceps, right? Mm -hmm. So you need like a specific routine to actually bulk up the biceps, right? Well, Alzheimer's patients, a lot of them have a, a, their prefrontal cortex is actually shot. They're like completely torn, torn like, you right. know, kaput, right? Yeah. So then what happens is they have, no ex control, they have no executive functions, controls of executive functions, meaning that they, that's why they lose their temper. That's why they get violent mm -hmm. because their, their prefrontal cortex has been atrophied. Well, you know, we, we can get the miracle grow in there. We can get the vascular stuff. We can get, you know, stimulation even. Mm -hmm. But we got to have the person actually start wiring those neurons, like working out your biceps. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what we do. So we help people uh, to with neurofeedback to sculpt their brain so that they can actually develop that aspect of their brain again, bulk it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're, they're functioning better. They're not having the temperaments and things like that. Um, and then on the on the sleep side, we've got our own sleep platform that we're able to measure the brain waves, uh, manufacture delta waves, which is what I was mentioning, which is like a, it's like a washing machine for the, the for the brain, delta waves, yeah. and it gets all the amyloid clad. So you have to clear that stuff out. So you had a good question: how do you, how do you know what what are people doing on that? Mm -hmm. And and the answer is forty hertz. So forty hertz is a frequency that uh, when you actually activate forty hertz, uh, you're able to uh, to induce changes uh, the cellular level uh, that actually ha activates the cells that actually clear up the amyloid plaque. Mm. Uh, and, and so 40 hertz in it for, I don't know, for three years or four years, I was completely obsessed about anything to do with 40 hertz. Yeah. I got 40 hertz PMF. I got 40 hertz lights in my eyes. I got 40 hertz mm -hmm. into, you know, uh, whole body vibration. I got 40 hertz vest. I've got 40, everything 40 hertz. Mm -hmm. 40 hertz alternate current, 40 hertz direct current, 40 hertz pulse electromagnetic frequencies, pulse of, uh, what is it, a... Uh, biophotomodulation, different kinds of lights. I mean, it's crazy. So, and, and uh, we found ways without chemically inducing any uh, biochemicals to actually induce 40 hertz and actually clear that amyloid plaque, wow. right? And, and, then, and then when they go to sleep, they can then actually kick in their, you know, their brains, uh, their head's uh, washing machine to kind of rinse everything out. Mm -hmm. so, then, so then they rinse, repeat, and put the rinse on. And then after that, what happens is the emotional aspect of it is the most important. And that's where our work, our keystone work with the fascia maneuver and fascia maneuver uh, fascia foundation uh, comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, because what happens is all these emotional and psychophysiological things that we face in our lives, 
100, we thought that they were stored in the autonomic nervous system, but in reality, they're stored in the fascia. Mm-hmm. And the fascia is a system of the body that surrounds absolutely every organ, every bone in the body is, is surrounded by fascia. Okay, and what is the fascia about, made out of? Fascia is, a, is a, a matrix of jelly-like matrix of collagen and silica okay. and all these things. And it looks like it looks like it looks kind of gooey and everything else like that, but it's actually photonic, and it, it could be affected through photons and it communicates through photons. Mm-hmm. There's actually more connections and, and uh, like neurological and everything on fascia than even the brain and any of the other body systems because it's everywhere. Yeah. Right. And and, and if you think about the fascia, if you think about the human body, you have your muscle skeletal system and hormones. Mm-hmm. You've got your organs and your emotions, and then you have fascia. And fascia is a higher level of like the network stack, mm, okay. right? Um, and the interesting thing about fascia is that fascia is our our main organ to experiencing our out like ex- our exist like our our environment, interpreting our environment. Mm, mm-hmm. it, it's like it's it, it operates at you know millions of times faster than the brain. So it's actually looking at real time situations and making mm. sense of all these different things. Yeah. And, and what happened is the, the fascia is where, you know, you have your thoughts and then those thoughts are tied to emotions and those emotions are felt in different parts of the body. It could be organs and things like, for example, liver, you'd be anger and different things like this. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and folks have already mapped this out. We, we've correlated them as well. They do change. It's not always on the same location, okay. but but then they go to your organs and then those organs are you feel a sensation. And, and, and an emotion, you have that emotion and the sensation, and then that sensation is tied to the subconscious level of the mind. Mm. So, um, so fascia is really like the wrapper where all these different reactions are stored. And, and being a long-term meditator with Vipassana and Vipassana being a sensation-based uh, liberation technique, uh, for me, this is wonderful because I was able to actually put two, two and two together of like a liberation practice along with, with you know, with, uh, scientific evidence yeah. of, of the impact to it and and then and then coupled to that the other part is besides you know the liberation of your your spirit i guess you could say at some point but besides that um the the fascia also stores stress our reaction so what most people think that are like stress in our lives like taxes or mother-in-laws or mm-hmm. like covid or whatever yeah. those are actually stressors they're, they're not stress our reactions to those things are actually stress, mm. right? Yeah. So, so, and these reactions are actually stored in the fascia. And as you, as you, as we live our lives, we encounter stressors every day, uh, may, many times a day. And what happens is your brain actually, uh, your your brain like gets a thought, like it says, "Hey, I'm feeling this." the stress that that is you know of this external world mm. and and then it starts trying to figure out a spins out a pro like a window on a tab in your in your your computer and opens up a new tab to actually solve that problem right because it's feeling a stress mm. it's feeling that reaction why is that reaction and what happens is these stress is, is mental stress and it's also emotional stress so we keep building up this emotional load and at the end of the day we keep filling up it's like a cup we have a cup of, of uh, capacity of stress, and every day we just keep overflowing it, and we never empty out this cup. Mm. And and the work with fascia and fascia maneuvers and fascial therapy that is not just physical, but there's all, all kinds of different ways you can affect fascia, mm. um, is is actually the work of of being able to liberate yourself from those reactions and that stress. Mm-hmm. And as you do that, the because you're we're under so much stress because that stress. The, the more stressed you are, the fascia is more restricted, constricted. Okay. So it constricts all of our organs when we're stressed, right? And, and then the more we have, the, the, the more, there's something called the signal to noise ratio, which is like all these stressors are like noise. And the natural signal of our body is very low, but this other noise level is very high. And what happens is when you're doing this fascia therapy or techniques, you're actually loosening up the fascia and you're releasing that pressure it's, 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 it's releasing, and then that pressure is liberating ourselves from these reactions. So we actually start loosening up, be, becoming less stressed. Mm-hmm. And as we become less stressed, that's huge because 75 to 90% of all medical conditions, I'm told uh, by professional doctors, are caused by stress or they're aggravated by stress. So your prognosis is going to be less if you're actually stressed. Mm-hmm. Now imagine if we can actually have somebody completely relax everything while they start expanding and all the organs start expanding, everything starts healing. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely what we're seeing with the fascia maneuvers and the fascia therapies. 
right? Uh, we're seeing that healing taking place. And, and it's super exciting because there are different pathways to affect fascia. Uh, we've done it with, you know, uh, you know mixes of, of breath and carbon, oxygen and carbon. We've done it mm -hmm. through vibrations. We've done it through lights, photonics. We've done it through structured water. We've done it through, you know, many different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and each time that you have these, this relaxation of the fascia, I mean, it's, it's powerful. People, their physiology changed. Mm. We had a lady who looked like she, she lost about 10 years of life. I mean, 10 years of, of age just wow. immediately after one of these training sessions. So, so, and, and we've had people who have chronic conditions, you know, uh, can't name them, but uh, that, you know, uh, they had, uh, you know, things, <laughs> they, could, they could do things they couldn't do before. Mm. You know, because they're relaxed. Well, they literally seen a person grow an inch. A, a 54-year-old really? man grew one inch in a matter of six minutes. Wow. Right? Your fascia is relaxed, so therefore everything can expand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, so, so this work that we did on the part of the governance, emotional governance and resilience building for Alzheimer's patients and their family uh, is it's, it's really, do uh, at the end of the day, we thought it was autonomic nervous system, but in reality it's fascia. And we spent quite a bit of time actually quantifying the science of fascia and, mm -hmm. and working on some. Yeah, so how do you, how do you measure fascia uh, contraction or expansion? Oh, like yeah. So, so there's different ways. I mean, literally that could be like a three hour conversation okay. uh, around that, but um, fascia is photonic fascia is sonic fascia emits a, a radiates a field, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, fascia affects autonomic nervous system. So think about this because it surrounds absolutely every organ in the body. When you are able to actually help the body feel that it's safe and secure and, 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 and everything is good mm. and it can relax, that it's going to affect every organ in the body that does that. Yeah. So if you ask me, how do you measure fascia? You need big data of the body. Mm. Because if you're just looking at breath or you're looking at autonomic nervous system or brain functions or, or even that, after you do that, if you're not looking at sleep and the impact your sleep because your brain, uh, the, the, the uh, cranial bones in your brain completely release, you know, and now your lymphatic system is going to work better. I mean, there's all these different dimensions. So, so it is, it is a very moving picture. We can take snapshots of the, the, re, the, the upstream, like the downstream and, and as close as we can with measuring directly measuring the fascia. Mm. I mean, we can measure the entropic field. We can measure things like this, right? Like, you know, uh, we can measure the, the, the fascia emissions mm -hmm. and now you're getting into, is it fascia? Is it like your biofield? What is that, right? And then even when you're getting into biofield, you get into other things, right? Mm -hmm. So, so think about your question is complex because uh, there's many different layers. It's like an onion, and there's a physical layer, there's energetic layer, there's all kinds of different layers after that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, and even on the physical layer, the impact to all the different subsystems is is pretty profound. So, um, yeah. So, so one of the the cool things is that we we weren't able to do before, but we're doing now is, uh, you know, pretty excited about a partnership that we have with the Epigenetic Clock Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that just came in line with the Brain Mechanics Foundation. And pretty excited about that because what it does, it actually allows us to actually measure uh, through um, DNA methylation mm -hmm. and blood markers, uh, you know, having a good epigenetic change and what affects it. So, and we have like a closet full of stuff that actually would affect that. Yeah. Uh, specifically, we're, we're testing out an anti-aging protocol. But, but uh, the, you know, on the Alzheimer's side, like we expect pretty much anything that is impacting fascia is, is going to have a, an impact to your epigenetic age. Because I believe that the epigenetic age is actually modulated by the fascia because mm -hmm. it's, it's stress. Mm -hmm. These are stressors, right? They're trans, you know, you can have uh, transgenerational stressors. Right. Like you could have like somebody who had a, a famine in Denmark and then all of a sudden it's like their relatives are still feeling that. Now, imagine imagine the epigenetic stress that we're going to have now because of COVID. We've all been sitting here. We've all experienced uh, large amounts of stress in our lives for the past two years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So we actually set up a lab there and, and moved there for a few months. Uh, and it was a pretty interesting experience. Uh, they were living in the garage. But uh, the folks here are very sensitive uh, they're very fascially aware people, uh, and and so so the opportunity was to actually work on determine what actually would affect fascia at a deep level uh, with people who were very sensitive. Uh, uh, so it's kind of like a cannery in a in a in a, uh, in, a in a mine, right? What do you mean very sensitive? Uh, so, uh, like uh, they're very aware. 
So like okay. uh, like anything that you would try with them, they would know feel the last minutia of what you did. Mm. Okay. Without actually having to get, it's, it becomes almost like uh, they're like sensors to me trying things. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so anyway, so we we build a lab to actually measure the effects of it, but also things that would actually affect fascia. Mm -hmm. And so we had some hypotheses, and and uh, it was wonderful. Like we, we you know, it was like nine months of work, uh, but now we have a really good blueprint of understanding fascia and different parts of fascia. And one of the experiments that we did there uh, was uh, with related to um, because the fascia feels safer when it's, there's, uh, like the fascia feels safe when you're like in a, for example, for example, a flotation tank because there's less restrictions. So mm -hmm. you, it can expand, right? Mm -hmm. And the fascia is very good at sensing pressure, internal pressure, external pressure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we start play, playing around with, uh, with pressure and internal pressure and things like that. And that took us into a road of hyperbaric chambers and things and other things, which we tested and all that. Uh, and it got to a point where we actually then uh, started working with a machine that allowed us to actually do adaptive training, meaning that we could actually control the CO2 and mm -hmm. oxygen levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, lo and behold, it's really interesting um, where uh, I, I put an individual doing a, a specific pose and, and a fashion maneuver pose, and they would have certain rest restrictions, physical restrictions. Like mm -hmm. physically, they couldn't do anymore. And then and what happened was we would then give them uh, CO2 and we get them to actually change the CO2 in internally as well, mm -hmm. but also CO2, like uh, being able to breathe in through with the CO2, yeah. but also doing a breath practice uh, stacked uh, on top of that. And then, and then what we felt is that we, we actually felt like the what they were feeling was that the the CO2 and the breath work was the CO2 was actually accelerating the movement of the fascia, the activation mm -hmm. of the fascia, mm -hmm. uh, and then it was pretty cool because afterwards we then hit it up with oxygen and it went like clearing of restrictions like this, like literally really? like we call it the Mexican lowrider pretzel squat because it was a pretzel squat they're squatting and all of a sudden it's like they can only get so much and all of a sudden we hit we do the carbon and all of a sudden oxygen and goes like that. Um, and then furthermore, we did things like uh, CO2 uh, through gas as well as CO2 through, uh, through uh, consumption through liquids like uh, carbonated water and things okay. like that. And, and they were very susceptible to the carbonated water, uh, super susceptible to the, the breathing as well. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but we, we realized that at that time we, had a, we, needed, to, uh, we, we needed to throttle the CO2 and, and oxygen mix portion of it, mm -hmm. uh, which, which then... Um, Took, a, took me into the journey of uh, talking to you and yeah. reaching out to you because we had seen something on the Ben Greenfield uh, podcast uh, and and uh, mentioning the carbogen generator uh, mm -hmm. and and the mix. I think it's Medulla's mix. Yeah, Medulla's, Medulla's, Medulla's yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, anyway, so we were intrigued about that, but we were intrigued about it because we also saw the psychophysiological effects that CO2 would have. Yeah. which is also fascia. So it's also the psychology aspect of fascia, but the physical aspect of fascia too. And, and that was super interesting. So um, I, was, I had been doing a, quite a bit of research on um, helping people disconnect from the default mode network. So their brain disconnect from the default mode network, uh, which mm -hmm. is what uh, a theogen uh, substances like psilocybin, LSD, ayahuasca, uh, uh, rapé, and all these other ones do, right? They, they disconnect you from the default mode network. Uh, mm -hmm. And what happens is when you do that, uh, your your sense of identity and things like that that you're holding on to, thinking about the future, past, and all these things, you're no longer that. You're in a state of some other place, mm -hmm. and and that becomes a bit of rest, right? Getting people to, to disconnect it, right? So we we yeah. were fascinated by ways that we could actually do that naturally, and we're doing that with breath, we're doing it with certain practices, uh, but we were really curious to try, um, you know, the the carbogen because it was actually being used as a screening tool for. Uh, psychedelic journeys in, uh, mm -hmm. by Stan Groff in the 60s, right? In yeah. the 50s and 60s, right? So it was a screening tool and people were reporting that they were getting actually more profound experiences from five breaths of carbogen than they were from the LSD trip. Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that became super fascinated. So initially we reached out to you for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we started seeing on your site that you're using carbon, uh, carbon dioxide to actually induce uh, uh, using creams and things and people are yeah. getting younger. Well, I'm like, yeah, you're spot treaming the fascia right there in their face because you're yeah, adding carbon thing, dioxide. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, another Sorry, thing with, um, yeah, there's research showing that that carbon dioxide through um, 
carboxy therapy, where it's transdermal or injecting the carbon dioxide, it actually changes the carb collagen fibers to be more youth-like, like changes the structure, the the quality of the of the collagen to be more youth-like. So I wonder how that change. I wonder how it fascia changes as you age. Oh, uh, listen, you're you're actually what I believe. I mean, it's early, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. I just want to say it's early. Uh, it's early in the steps. Like we just, we just, Steve and, and uh, the conscious breathing folks were kind enough to lend us a unit, uh, yeah. a unit and some other devices that we're going to collaborate on. Uh, it's early on, but I, I do believe that, that uh, transdermal uh, carbon dioxide, um, uh, it actually is a direct entrainment of the fascia mm -hmm. and, and affects fascia directly. And that's why um, these other things that you're mentioning, like collagen, uh, plumpness, uh, all mm -hmm. that, all these things will come into line. But I do believe that actually we're affecting fascia scale. And and mm -hmm. um, if if this is actually uh, observed and and we see that that is this indeed the case, uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're talking about a device that will revolutionize the world. Yeah, that could revolutionize, uh, you know, mental care as well as uh, physical, because we believe now um, that that it will actually has the potential to impact biological aging, epigenetic aging. And now that we mm -hmm. can measure it, we're mm -hmm. going to be able to tell if that actually is uh, affecting biological age or not. So I'm mm -hmm. super stoked about it. <laughs> working <Yeah>. with you, guys. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for you to start using it and letting us know your feedback. Yeah. And we yeah, have the, we'll have the carbogen yeah. unit sent out to you pretty soon as well. Yeah, the carbogen is going to be really interesting, uh, really really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be uh, that's going to be. Yeah, we believe. I mean, it's only like three or five breaths that you need to take, and then you're you're in a, in a state. So we there. Mm. What we want to do is we want to measure like do full full EEG assessment. So looking all brain functions, things like you know um, P P two hundred P three hundred, which is uh, like looking at uh, processing of your vision processing and hearing processing. Uh, mm -hmm. We can look at brain functions, things like, you know, mm -hmm. time order judgment and, you know, neuroplasticity and all kinds of different things afterwards. Yeah. Uh, we're going to look at the autonomic nervous system. So really get into, I suspect also that we're going to be able to impact the, the, uh, the endothelial layer of the cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that, I think that's going to be really interesting to see that and we can measure that. Uh, and I'm really excited about, uh, you know, measuring, doing big data of the breath with you guys because uh, super cool to be able to take all these different measurements from like entropic fields and, you know, like your, you know, all these different things all the way up to like breath because now mm -hmm. it really paints the whole picture and and breath is life. It's kind of important, Steve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure is, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you, one thing you mentioned is the, you thought that, Something that's important with fascia is the contraction, and then the, the CO two helps the expansion, and that helps release some of the traumatic memories and stuff like that, or stressful memories. Are, are, when you say memories, is it just like feelings, or is it actually like uh, memories? Or memories, what? memories. Uh, I wouldn't say memories. I would say that these are stored sensations. Mm -hmm. There, there. There's uh, you. We as human beings, at the end of the day, the the we store our all of our experiences. Through sensations and we react to these sensations the sensations are either sensations of unpleasant sensation or pleasant sensation and mm -hmm. and when we when we when we feel an unpleasant sensation and we can't observe it without judging it then we generate a reaction right mm -hmm. and that reaction programs even more re more energetic imprints that's associated mm -hmm. with that that sensation, and that sensation is associated with emotions and thoughts and things like that. So it's all like a, a, a vortex. I mean, a, yeah. not a vortex, a, a matrix of, of connections, but it's all is all centered on the sensation level, right? So if and, you if you have like a something that triggers certain emotions, certain like traumatic emotions, like after you experience the expansion, will those triggers still create those same feelings? Or well, the the what the CO two will do will help to relax the fascia. Mm -hmm. uh, but we could, so at Brain Mechanics, we, we've, we have come up with training that we show people to do where they can go to the subconscious level of their mind and what the sensations are. And then we help them to show them how to edit that reaction, okay. like editing a word pad. It's called Thrive Training. Yeah. Uh, and we're certifying coaches and things like that on it. 
Uh, and, and so when you're able to do that, you're able to then get the files you need, but the CO2 aspect of it is going to get you to, to uh, be able to integrate and process this at a, at a, at a, at a deeper level. Because, mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, when we integrated the flotation tank into that protocol, it's called Thrive Training Protocol, um, we found great results because the fascia is able to relax mm -hmm. and is able to assimilate all that stuff. Because think about what just happened. You, you know, I, I say, for example, you're a person who grew up and you had a bad experience and all of a sudden you had a, a thought in your mind, like your dad said, you're not good enough. Now you're, I'm not good enough. And you have this program called I'm not good enough. And it, and yeah. it affects your entire life when you're like a six year old because you have high theta brain waves and you, ex you accept and, and feel like everything is the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the tooth fairy in Santa Claus. And then, and then when your dad says you're not good enough, that becomes a very core program in your exist in your, in your body. Right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 it, and it's a limited belief pattern, but that belief pattern is associated with a sensation. And, and that sensation, before you even get to the sensation, is associated with a thought. I'm not good enough. My dad doesn't think I'm good enough. And then you feel a reaction, a growth sensation, right, when, when that happens, right? And then that's, that, that's coupled with a, a, like an emotion. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's feeling useless. Maybe it's helplessness. Maybe it's anger. I'm angry at my dad. I'm angry at the world, right? And then you grow up and you ex encounter all these different ex times in your life where that program just because you know comes up because you program it like it's a mm -hmm. thought right mm -hmm. and and so so you feel that thought you feel that emotion and you feel a sensation and you keep reacting to that sensation mm -hmm. now now think about this what if we could actually go in and show somebody to actually be able to extract the wisdom from that sensation mm -hmm. the understanding they need and now just like the alzheimer's thing the root cause goes away and when right. you do that that program that you build your entire life on i'm not good enough crumbles it's like jenga yeah. just everything all the blocks fall on the ground and there's so much neurological wiring and energetic wiring and emotional wiring and mm -hmm. psychological wiring that was tied to that that has to be reconfigured mm -hmm. right yeah. and and where i see that uh that reconfiguration and then integration and and that could take about two three days sometimes it's like a, a very intense psychophysiological workout that you've been through to rewire yourself and where we see that, uh, where I see, where I hypothesize that with, with uh, the, uh, the CO2 transdermal would be that we could actually help accelerate the integration process. Uh, and, and it could be a matter of minutes instead of, you know, I would say hypothesize 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And, and we can, you can go to the deepest level of your subconscious level of the mind, pull out these programs and then be able to integrate in 30 minutes flat. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, that, um... that, would be, that would be really good. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, using Carbogen for the Medunas mixture, but um, one thing I I was listening to Dr. Daniel Amen recently mm -hmm. about brain scans with Alzheimer's, and one th one thing he mentioned is that one of the first things they notice is lack of blood flow um, to yeah. the brain in Alzheimer's patients, and I think Carbogen is one thing that does increase cerebral blood flow to the brain. Yeah. And as well, well as as well as hypoxic areas throughout the body. Absolutely, absolutely. Because the combination of carbon dioxide and oxygen, if properly synced them to, together, mm -hmm. you have the potential of actually. Uh, what happens is with Alzheimer's patients, and honestly, they call this the aging process, is that you have parts of the body that just get into like brownouts, where you're not getting enough circulation there. Your mitochondria, first of all, there's mitochondria is not really working really well, and then that starts affecting the cardiovascular system and that region, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you don't have that. Then it just starts turning into brownouts. Literally, it's like looks like a brownout, like right. Mm. Or, you know the analogy. But anyway, yeah. but uh, and, and then what happens is when you actually are able to dance with the CO2 and oxygen at the right time, the right mix, mm. it'll it'll actually unblock those brownouts and it'll give it the oxygen that it needs to transport it, right? Because mm. oxygen, high levels of oxygen and high level of plasma are usually uh, mutually exclusive, and what we figured out is a way to actually make them inclusive. Uh, and along the way, but now you're talking about that's just on the breathing side. But mm -hmm. if you're actually affecting it through the external side, I, I really believe that it would actually help with what we're trying to do. Which is, I don't think you, I don't know if you remember earlier. I mentioned that one of the things we do is we increase the miracle grow of the brain, brain derived neurotrophic factors, yeah. and then the vascular and the theolial growth factors. Right? Vascular is your vascular system. So mm -hmm. what you just said there, Steve. Leads, it's it's something that looks really promising to take what we've already developed and add the CO2 mix into it to mm -hmm. actually get it into a, a better state. 
especially when you stack it with things like biophotomodulation, things like PMFs, things like you know um, other other fascia tuning elements that you can throw into the mix. Uh, and, and then you got something because you can increase nitrous oxide. It'll just blow up. You can get into, you know, get the circulation going and then get the CO2 going. And yeah, I mean, I think it's mm. going to be like, honestly, it's going to be like rotor rooter for the brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> along with like a washing machine that you turn on at night. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the uh, constricted fascia, would that be characteristic of like lack of blood flow, lack of oxygen, lack of... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. You've got nine uh, bones in the in the the brain, in the cranial area, and mm -hmm. um, these nine bones. When you have any kind of, uh, when your when your fascia is constricted, you're gonna squeeze like this. But you also have inflammation along with that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so somebody who's got like traumatic brain injury, they're getting inflamed, but they're constricted. So they're pu trying to push the infl inflammation mm -hmm. outward, but they're constricting on the bones. And the inflammation so that's that's be, when. What do you characterize inflammation as like when the water is more bulk like and it's less structured so it's so the proteins don't fold prop as properly and Oh no, I'm talking about a body inflammatory response like okay. autoimmune and like you know like a mm -hmm. standard American diet or like like inflammatory like your tissue swells up because you, right, you get right. stuff going on yeah. right and and what happens is that even pushes out even more internal pressure to the fascia and the fascia is feeling an external pressure not a good mm -hmm. situation not a good mm -hmm. situation and in fact that's what most of the, the traumatic brain injuries that um, the, the, the team in the human garage saw a few years ago, 85% uh, of them actually, uh, the client had traumatic brain injuries. And, 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 but it's not even the traumatic brain injury, um, that is a misnomer. Uh, the trauma could be physical and your brain is still resolving it. It's a, it's a, it's a traumatic brain injury, like, and your brain will swell up that way and, and all its characteristics. So, so I would say, you know, but anyway, so-called traumatic brain injury, um, and, and so, so when you have that pressure, releasing the fascia helps and then having the growth factors you need, the parental stimulation that you need to actually rewire your brain so it functions better, uh, is mm -hmm. the way to go. So, so that happens in traumatic brain injuries, Alzheimer's, which is a pretty bad trauma, right? Like you have all yeah. this amyloid plaque, you know, wrecking every, every part of your, your cells and your, 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 your neurons in your brain, right? That's mm -hmm. a pretty big trauma. And then you have all these different re oxidative oxidative reactions that happen right. after that, right? So CO2 therapy, I would say, would be a, like a really low-hanging fruit that would have a significant effect. Um, mm -hmm. um, and the cool thing is we could do the test, Steve. Like we could actually measure brain functions before and after. Mm -hmm. We could say, okay, this is brain functions of a person who's got maybe uh, whatever condition has been diagnosed with, and they can come into our facility in our lab. It is a community resource. So if you're in Calgary, Welcome to stop by and, 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 and kick the tires and all these things. But yeah, um, cool. and, and so so uh, but what we could we could do it before and after to say this is your brain functions and, and this is your brain functions after. And it, it should should see a clear indication of a change. What mm -hmm. the, that that might be, I don't know yet. And we could do that for other other areas of the, of the, the body as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but I would think CO two is a is a really good. Uh, it's gonna. I think honestly, I think there's gonna be a whole new realm of medicine that's gonna be all around mm -hmm. CO two. Yeah, I mean, CO2 is protective directly against reactive oxygen species and suppresses the formation of them and um, has a lot of protective effects from them, so. Yeah, 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 um, and when you couple that with things like hydrogen, too, and other things, which are like a universal antioxidant, is also mm -hmm. selective. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's going to be like, wow, I don't even know. Like, yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. You know, yeah. So normally when we think of Alzheimer's, we think of like plaques in the brain and brain function, blood flow through the brain. So what is, how does, um, like the, working on the whole body with the whole fascia system and the memories and the trauma, how does that affect Alzheimer's and, and the brain? Yeah, well, well, you know, the, you're going through, imagine losing your sense of identity. Mm -hmm. imagine, imagine having no control of your emotions and hurting the people that you love. Hmm. You know, imagine feeling so hopeless because there's nothing that you they can do for you mm -hmm. and your whole life is going to disintegrate in front of you yeah. uh that's that is a very um i would consider that a very very stressful situation uh i, I would consider that would be uh very damaging to anybody's biology all systems of the body 
mm-hmm. um, because you know, and 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 so when you're looking at Alzheimer's and these things, I mean, you have to look at a holistic way. You have to look at like how is this? You know, you can't really just look at the brain, right? And and so so I think that um, with with Alzheimer's, when you're able to actually when you're able to actually go to the root cause, the sensation level, mm-hmm. and you're able to observe sensations with equanimity, I don't think that there's any condition that is causing your e disease that could be eradicated. Mm-hmm. I, I there is not one condition I, I believe, and, and I, that that can't be. I don't think I don't think it could be. I don't, I don't think there's any blockage in that. I think people actually are able to to heal themselves uh, when they do that. Yeah. And 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 because it's like uh you know um and and you know but 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 it's but it starts at that level but then it needs to be reinforced like we could we could help people progr- like help them with the, the storage uh, because okay to answer your question if 75 to 90% of medical conditions are are affected by stress I mean and it mm-hmm. would increase your prognosis then I would say that Anything that you can help you to actually decrease stress at such a deep level will help your prognosis. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I don't know if it's going to cure. I can't say I can't claim it's going to cure anything or uh, anyone, but uh, but I, but I have seen people help themselves, and I have seen people heal themselves. Mm-hmm. So you know, yeah, uh, and they did it. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so in the beginning, you kind of talked about the cause of Alzheimer's being like environmental stressors, like mold and other toxins in the environment. Are there other Factors like lifestyle factors, nutritional factors, or yeah, absolutely. All all those in our in our definition, all those would feed into if you eat bad nutrition and you're stressed, you're gonna have chronic type, potentially chronic type of Alzheimer's, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you have things like you know, uh, like right now, for example, I mean, I I, I don't want to, well, you know, glyphosate and things like this, right? Like there's things in their environment that we think even we're eating well, but then those things actually cause things like a breakdown in, in, in your gut lining, right? Mm-hmm. And, and not having, you know, the, the gut lining doesn't have what it needs to actually be healthy. Um, and you can get into bacteria, pathogens, fungi, and all kinds of different things around that. But then what happens is, uh, you know, if it's not, if it becomes permeable, then you're you're talking about now you eat a food and then that food particle goes into your bloodstream and now your immune system says this is a foreign invader. And then it mm-hmm. creates a whole cascade of reactions in your large intestine, for example. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's one area where, you know, even even just things that are put in our food could actually cause yeah. that. Right. Um, and about- then and then furthermore, furthermore, just real quick. Uh, yeah. There's also things like if your gut microbiota is not in a, in a, in a good, healthy state, then mm-hmm. a lot of the, the the a lot of the different nootropic factors and like things like signaling molecules and things that you need uh, for your healthy brain. To thrive like dopamine and things like that, you know, a serotonin, for example, ninety-five percent of serotonin is producing your large intestine, five yep. percent is producing your head, right? Mm-hmm. So you're not going to have that. So now you're talking about now it's affecting. Well, I don't feel so good, you know, and I'm not, you know, uh, and and then and then there's all these different things, right? So that could feed into atropic Alzheimer's, which is like you don't have enough stuff to actually run your brain. So we mm-hmm. need to release amyloid plaque. So all these things are, are affecting, but not just affecting Alzheimer's; they're affecting. So many different conditions. I mean, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you th- if you ask me, it's it's mostly like we were talking about, like uh, you know, uh, yeah, things like you know, um, lifestyles and 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 mm-hmm. living a good life. And 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 mm-hmm. I, that certainly brings up a good point, really, right? Like, what kind of life are we living at now? Like, what are the things that we prioritize? What are the things that we do in this life? You know, like you know, we're spending all our time and energy building all these sandcastles. And I got to tell you, like, seeing my dad pass away. I mean, he, he was a, he was a bodybuilder. Like he took care of his body. He was a, you know, he was, he like the guy like created orphanages in Vietnam and did mm, stuff. Wow. You know, he was a soldier and did all these wonderful things. He was a really good person. But, you know, one of the things that I learned, I'll share with you is like, at the end of the day, like, I mean, he saved, he retired as a millionaire and he, he had a lovely wife and a loving family. And he, he did come from an abused family and he never, he was the kindest soul I'd ever met. Yeah. And it really taught me to live a life of service. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I was meditating next to his body as his body's passing. And mm. it was just a sack of bones, man. It was a sack mm. of bones. And and he couldn't take any of these things with him. And mm-hmm. and then that that was the moment. That was the moment that I realized, what kind of life do I want to live in? Yeah. What am I here for? 
And, and that, that was a moment where I just decided to let go and just to trust and just let the flow. And, you know, it's scary, man, because, you know, you let go and you want to control these things and all that. But we're holding on so tightly to these rocks. We're all on this river. And, yeah. you know, it's scary. But once you let go, it's like it's so wonderful. It's beautiful because it's like you, you're just you just you surrender and, and you gain the strength of the whole river. And that's what's mm -hmm. been going on for the past, six, you know. Eight years now, Steve, yeah, where, you know, we're working with beautiful people and, 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 you know, people who really want to make the world a better place and, mm -hmm. and, and nothing's lacking is from an abundance perspective. So, you know, um, so I think that, you know, when, when you, you could live life, uh, you know, holding on so tightly and using so much energy, you can let go and just trust. Right. And, yeah. and there's so many different people now that are, you're seeing that it, there seems to be some kind of awakening or something going on in this world and mm -hmm. I, I would I would say that look I use my example I I, I wasn't a doctor and I, I was an R&D guy and and we believed and we surrendered and and when you do this ma wonderful things manifest in your life and 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 the grace of God can manifest in your life and mm -hmm. and when that happens it's like you know <laughs> I'm just I'm just now a you know a a, a glorified you know attendant here just trying to do the better good you know yeah that's that's really awesome appreciate your attitude of service and, and letting go and going at the flow and uh, you're doing an amazing job with ray mechanics um but before before we end i just wanted to talk about more like nutritionally like some people think that sugar plays a role or that are that are more low carb people or low carb people think that it's methionine and like um or, or vegan or like vegan type approaches mm. think it's methionine and and the certain fats and are there certain like bad fats or is it sugar mm. is, it, is it different like in uh nutritional things that we should be concerned about like with alzheimer's or yeah absolutely i mean i, I would say that um uh, based on uh, the training that I, I received from uh, uh, Dr. Brinson, um, I, I could say that um, those things play a role. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that the number one is um, whatever food you're eating, please eat organic. Uh, introducing a toxin into your body, uh, even if you're eating good food, is is the road to not 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 good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so number one is you know that that's so so important. Um, number two is that, you know, it's been really well studies uh, on, um, you know, things like a Mediterranean diet where you have, you know, a large number of things like polyphenols on olives mm -hmm. and, and on all kinds of different, you know, uh, substances around that. And, and, and then eating, you know, eating, eating like sociably, you know, like uh, I think eating is so important, uh, but we're not conscious eating. You know, you, you guys mm -hmm. are conscious breathing. We're not conscious eating. We're where where I don't think people realize that no matter what kind of food you have, your energy goes into that food and you're communing and you're actually transmuting that food in, internally, right? So uh, so when you're when you're looking at your phone and you're looking at the news about this and that and the other that stresses you out, you're actually changing first your biology into being a fight or flight state, where you should be parasympathetic state, which in fact in fact uh, now it actually might be a good application right before you hit your uh, your food, you hit your relaxator. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how many minutes you would recommend, but we would want to get people into a, a more a parasympathetic state, which I believe is what I felt when I did yeah. the practice with yeah. you earlier. I was put in a more parasympathetic state, which is relaxing and digestion. So I, I would I would maybe do that. I mean, right mm -hmm. away, like I would say, if you're looking at actually engaging with food and having a positive eating organic, and honestly, sounds I'm mean, not trying to do a plug in, but but putting yourself in a parasympathetic state, yeah. whether it's through Whatever it is, I find that your device super convenient because you could do that in a matter of three minutes, uh, yeah. and, and then and then be on be on your way. Um, Even just then, a minute's helpful too, like before yeah. a meal or something. Yeah, and then and then so what that's going to do is very important because not if you're in fight or flight, you take food, your body's thinking food fight or flight, and it's going to be a, an aggressive posture and it's going to have a reaction. You see, mm -hmm. so super important that you eat in a parasympathetic state, uh, no matter what kind of food you have. Uh, so organic person with study. And then if you're going to be eating something like, you know, a standard Mediterranean diet is good. Um, I think, you know, fruit, vegetables and things like that. Um, you know, periods of, you know, human beings uh, where we're actually putting something artificial. We weren't used to uh, always having Costco around. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I think that only happened only maybe about the, the last 30 nice. years or 40 years. Yeah. But, right? So, so we weren't used to this, right? And we weren't mm-hmm. used to that getting, you know, all everything that we uh, excess, tons of excess uh, intake for many years. Human beings mm-hmm. are designed to actually encounter period, elegantly designed to encounter periods of famine and abundance. Mm-hmm. And, and you have that maybe four times a year where you have cycles of famine and abundance, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so things like, you know, I would say right off the bat, things like time-restricted eating would be a really good, you know, yeah. safe idea for most people. Um, and, and then even like, for example, I eat myself, I eat a meal a day. Um, okay. I did an experiment where I didn't eat any food for 14 days. I had a little bit wow. of water, a little bit of uh, uh, watermelon juice, and I, I got that's another topic for another story. I did yeah. some... Uh, Psychedelics so you, and tr- so you're doing the, and, and, the OMAD, I guess. <laughs> What's that? You're doing the OMAD. Yes. One yes, meal a day. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. One meal a day. Yeah. But but uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, one meal a day, and uh, yeah, it's, it works for me. You know, um, I just feel like my uh, listen to your body, but but in, including something that will actually activate parts of your biology that is there to actually help you survive as a human being. You're mm-hmm. hardwired for these things, then stimulate those things. You know, like mm-hmm. go times when you go 24 hours without eating, or 36 hours, or, or like I did, 14 days, right? Yeah. I, I mean, there's people who are who are breatharians. I don't know if you heard of them, but they're yeah. they actually claim uh, that you know they can actually exist with with and it for a while actually. I mean, I was doing water, but I you know I realized that so that experiment was actually getting rid of my addiction to food. So mm-hmm. I would actually for 14 days put food in my mouth savor it mm. and feel the sensation of the addiction of the food yeah uh, put myself in a meditative state i would observe the cravings i would observe the aversions i would observe my mind memories of past things and i would spit mm. it out and and i would be in a state of equanimity and i would liberate myself from that and mm. i literally mm-hmm. liberated 20 20 pounds of my body wow <laughs> in 14 days and wow. I, I i was swollen i was like i would I, I didn't know i would my face was swollen my everything uh-huh. was swollen my whole body was swollen, but it was actually, you might call that trauma. You might say my past reactions, my sankaras, my mm-hmm. uh, egos or whatever, but I'm mm-hmm. 20 pounds lighter from that stuff now, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and that was actually psychophysi- uh, you know, psychosomatic and psychophysiological uh, stuff that, that we did there. Uh, and there may or may not have been any uh, uh, theogens in, into the mix right. <laughs> <laughs> in, in that experiment, but it, it was pretty yeah. cool, pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Yeah. So I guess um, so. There's quite a lot to your your protocol. There's a lot of different things you measure. Like, so if someone wants to like learn more about what you do or get involved in what you're doing, how do you learn more about it? Or how do you, do you have to like live like nearby you, or can they live anywhere in the world and do your no, uh, work with you? Or? Yeah. So so there are parts of uh, so what we're doing is we're, we're we're in the process now of helping others help others. So that's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So first we want to help people who want to help themselves and then we want to help others who are helping others, right? And, yeah. and that's going to be the model that scales for us. Uh, and then um, and, and so what we're doing now is we're actually building up the infrastructure to certify people. So if mm-hmm. you have a, a mom that has Alzheimer's, we're going to certify you to apply the Alzheimer's Resolution Protocol, which we're making open source, mm-hmm. right? So and this is how you could actually help your mom. And we don't consider that um, medical care. We consider that wellness. Yeah. We we are we use all wellness. We use you know uh, a lot of techniques and things. It's all wellness. It's all helping somebody become well. If you're well, there's going to be no disease, you mm. know. Um, and and we don't you know we get don't get into diagnosis, but we're in there to supporting people with these protocols. So we would certify them. We would then uh, you know if you're a doctor and you're looking to actually help others, we would certify you to apply the protocol and and give you the health technology uh, platforms. Uh, and also, mm-hmm. like you know, uh, do things like cloud-based services and things like that. But, but I would say that um, in the end, I think that the important thing is uh, if people feel like you know, uh, like we look, this is we're operating as a non-for-profit, uh, and and so I am a living a life of service here, and I'm living a life of 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 just trying to be like a good Samaritan, right? And and because I, seeing my dad pass away in a couch this way and. And what happened there, and, and and my family, and all that stuff. Life is too short. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to mess around. I want to. I want to be able to make an impact in helping people, and that's why I came here on this planet to do. So, mm-hmm. so if you feel like you know you have relatives and people uh, that, that that could need the help, 
Uh, or if you want to help roll your sleeves and help us actually help the world make a, the world a better place, and you can go to brainmechanics.org, um, or I can just, uh, you know, yeah, we could do that, and then you guys mm-hmm. can leave us a message, and, and, you know, we could use the help. I mean, right now where we are is, like, we, we need to help with things that are not even scientific stuff. It's like marketing and, like, helping, yeah. you know, how do we make this message? It's more like communications problems and, mm-hmm. you know, things like that. But, but uh, you know, I, I believe that, that, you know, we can we can – help the world and and everybody has the power to do that and and i would encourage you to follow your path mine is started with alzheimer's and here we are we're <laughs> we're doing other things and, and, and jamming with people like like you steve i mean mm-hmm. I, I think that i'm so happy thankful and so grateful to have met you mm-hmm. uh and 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 and, and anders because I, I i believe that that the work that you're doing it's gonna it's gonna be a force multiplier and it's gonna be ten x results to what we've already been doing. Yeah. So I I, so, I so. I, yeah. So I, so I just want to say that and, and and tell you that a goodness or a heart. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, yeah. And thank you for your work. I think that you guys are doing great work. And breath awareness is breath is life. And if you're not aware of your breath, you're not aware of life. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Steve, um, you know, so grateful for Mm -hmm. your contribution on on the breath space and uh and so i I just wanted to kind of offer up uh a gift uh for you and and your uh Mm. your podcast uh folks um and uh so what i'm going to offer is is something called self trainer Uh, and self trainer um as you know working in breath that you know breath is something that um you know um you could do individual different techniques but um uh and and they all have their purpose and what we've done is we actually uh mapped out the, the entire spectrum of breath and and self trainer guides people on understanding adopting these breath practices but not just breath we've actually included the fascia maneuvers which are uh, affect the human physiology at a deep level we discuss in a podcast we're, we're including that as well as um the equanimity practice uh and self trainer and what we'd like to do for for your listeners is give them uh you know a complimentary self trainer uh practice uh it'll be one of the breath work practices mm-hmm. that we do that that similar to the relaxator has mm. a really profound effect. Now, if you actually were to do this practice with a relaxator, I would say you wow. would even get better wow, results. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a, it's a, it's wonderful. So yeah, I'd like to offer that up, and I'll I'll, I'll provide yeah. a link. So yeah, appreciate share with that. The folks yeah. who will get the podcast. Yeah, yeah. We're uh, and we also get you know we also meet every so often um, and having events and things and doing group practices because we believe in and helping the community and things mm-hmm. like that. So. Uh, when those come, uh, uh, you know, when, when we have those, I'll share them with you. You can and share with your, your followers, and that way we can uh, all kind of work together to uh, yeah, help ourselves. Yeah, that's awesome. Because really, really appreciate that. Tonight. I know everyone will. <laughs> well, yeah, I appreciate all you're doing as well, and you're doing quite an amazing things, collaborating with a lot of amazing people, and I think you're going to change the world with everything you're doing. So, Well, Steve, appreciate we are going to change the world. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. So... All right, well, thanks for being on the call. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Many blessings to you.